Welcome to this special segment of Amazing Facts Ministries. There's a long forgotten prophecy of Revelation 9.15, which played a major role of the early Advent believers during the 1830s and 40s. When the prophecy of Revelation 9.15 came to pass on the very day foretold, this greatly propelled the early Adventist movement forward. The fulfillment of this Bible prophecy clearly verified that a day in Bible prophecy represents a year in time. And this is called the year-day principle. Those early Adventist pioneers also recognized that Muslims were listed in Bible prophecy according to the fifth and sixth trumpets of Revelation 9. This week we catch up with Professor Ron Dupre in Bangladesh, where he carefully unfolds the amazing truth regarding the August 11, 1840 date of the Early Advent Movement. Good day, friends. Before we begin, let's have a prayer. Holy Father, bless us now as we take some moments to reflect on Scripture, to think deeply, and to look at history, guide and direct our study at this time. Amen. The topic I want to address is called, What Really Happened on August 11, 1840? There's a beautiful statement from a book called Life Sketches that goes this way. We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and His teaching in our past history. Now, the reason I raised that statement is because I want us to go back to the 1830s, the time when a Baptist farmer turned preacher by the name of William Miller shared his own findings from his study of Scripture. William Miller's main focus at that time was looking at a passage from the Bible found in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And I'm reading now from the New King James Version that says, for unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And Miller and others who were working with him used an important principle from Scripture as to how to interpret this 2,300-day prophecy. They looked at passages such as Ezekiel 4, verse 6, and Numbers 14, verse 34. And there they saw that in Bible prophecy, a prophetic day equals one literal year. And based upon that, they began to calculate, thinking, by the way, that the sanctuary was the earth, <laughs> thinking that the cleansing was going to be the fire at the time of Jesus' coming. They figured that if this 2300-day prophecy was talking about the cleansing of the earth at the coming of Jesus, they could figure out the actual time that Jesus would come. Now, they began to do some calculations. They were actually correct in their calculations coming up with the date, even though they had misunderstood the event. And they waited till October 22, 1844. They watched. They were greatly disappointed. But the question I want you to think about right now is this. Why were these Millerites so certain? And there were many of them, tens of thousands. And there were hundreds of thousands scattered all over the world. In fact, they were on six continents, five or six continents. They were preaching on this topic of the coming of Jesus. But why were they so certain that this year-day principle, that's the term that's used in, 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 amongst scholars and amongst Bible students, why were they so certain that the 2300 days mentioned in Daniel 8.14 equaled 2300 years? It's because of something that had happened just three or four years before. Let me give you the history and the background so you can understand why the Millerites knew for certain, and they were right, that they had the right day for the end of the 2300-day prophecy. You see, in mid-1838, a Methodist Episcopal minister by the name of Josiah Litch, and he was a young man, apparently in his mid-20s to late-20s, Josiah Litch, he was a supporter of William Miller's promotion of the Second Coming, and he studied deeply the Scriptures. He published a study that covered the fifth and sixth trumpets of the book of Revelation, specifically Revelation chapter 9. And based upon his study, he concluded that Revelation 9, verse 15, which we'll read in a minute, I quote now from Litch, is the most remarkable and definite 
even descending to the days of any in the Bible. And thus, Litch concluded that from his study, the Ottoman Empire would end on the 11th of August, 1840. Let's read a couple of verses from Scripture. Revelation chapter 9, verse 10, and then also verse 15. Revelation chapter 9, verse 10 says this. They, referring now to uh, uh, the fifth trumpet, uh, they had tails like scorpions with stingers. With their tails, they had power to harm people for five months. Now, the important point here is the five months. And over centuries, many Bible commentators, many Bible students have concluded that the five months, based upon the biblical month that is 30 days for a month, that this is 150 days. And in Bible prophecy, when we look at Scripture, a day equals a year. And so many scholars have correctly concluded that was a 150-year prophecy. Now what's interesting, if you get to verse 15, I'm reading now again. So the four angels were released who were prepared for, now this Bible says, for this hour, day, month, and year. And we're going to talk about different Bible translations in a minute. I'm reading now from the New American Bible. And I want to show you the difference that we have to be careful when we look at dynamic versions versus literal formal translations. And so, of course, over time there's been a debate. What does the book of Revelation talk about? Because it's recognized that the five months are 150 days equaling 150 years. But what about this phrase in Revelation 9 verse 15? And there are mainly two streams of Bible translations. The dynamic versions, such as the Amplified Bible, identify this as a moment in time. I quote now from the Amplified Bible of Revelation chapter 9 verse 15. That hour in the appointed day, month, and year. Very similar to the New American Bible I just read. Now the Revised English Bible turns the whole thing upside down and says, for this very year, month, day, and hour. So they, these Bibles, who are more dynamic, that are more dynamic rather than literal, make this a moment in time. However, interestingly, the literal translations, the formal translations, such as the New King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, say that this pa part of this passage should read the hour and day and month and year. And what Litch and others had done back then, they had added up an hour and a day and a month and a year. A year was 360 days. A month was 30 days. That makes 390. A day is one day. That's 391. And then they calculated that the hour, which is 1 24th of a day, would equal 15 days in prophetic time. And they concluded that this prophecy in Revelation 9, 15 covered 391 years and 15 days. Fascinating. Were they right? Were they on track? Let's explore that as we consider to see the evidence. Now, around the same time in the 1800s, there was a lady by the name of Ellen White who also reflected and wrote on this passage, on this concept. And this is what she said based upon her understanding and based upon what Litch had predicted. She wrote this. In the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. Now, please note, this book was first written with this uh, information in 1888, and it was republished and rewritten uh, and strengthened in 1911. So I repeat, in the year 1840, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy excited widespread interest. At the very time specified, that is August 11, 1840, Turkey, through her ambassadors, accepted the protection of the allied powers of Europe and thus placed herself under the control of Christian nations. The event exactly fulfilled the prediction. When it became known Multitudes were convinced of, notice the language here, the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation adopted by Miller and his associates. And a wonderful impetus was given to that interdenominational Millerite Advent movement. Men of learning and position united with Miller both in preaching and in publishing his views. And from 1840 to 1844, the work of this Millerite movement 
rapidly extended. Now that's found in the book called The Great Controversy, uh, page 334 to 335. I have a paperback uh, copy here. Uh, so that's where you can read the complete two paragraphs, The Great Controversy by Ellen White. Now I know there are some who've said, well, Ellen White, uh, in her writings, she was simply uh, remembering what people thought happened. But what's interesting, there are two uh, prophecies and two sections of fulfillment that are in the same book, The Great Controversy. This is on page 334, 335, these two paragraphs about the fifth and sixth trumpets of Revelation 9. But in the previous five paragraphs, Ellen White talks about the prophecy found in Revelation chapter 6, verse 13 of the falling stars. And what's amazing is if you look at the language she uses there to describe the fulfillment of the falling stars, which is a well-known factor in history, 1833, November 13. If you look at the language she uses for the falling of the stars and compare it with the language for Revelation 9, the Ottoman Empire, she has amazing similar languages. Language. For example, talking about the falling of the stars, she says there's this prophecy that had an, a striking, impressive fulfillment. Regarding Revelation 9, she says, another remarkable fulfillment of prophecy. She has a date specific here, November 13, 1833. Here she talks about the 11th of August, 1840. She says, for the falling of the stars, it was viewed with intense admiration or dread. For the Revelation 9, August 11 uh, prediction, it excited widespread interest. She quotes various sources that support the evidence about the falling of the stars, and then she does similarly, she quotes from Litch here. She says, for the falling of the stars, many witnessed it. And then she says, for Revelation 9 and its fulfillment, multitudes were convinced. It's amazing the similarities of her language. She says, people were directed to the fulfillment of prophecy concerning the falling of the stars. And similarly, the multitudes were convinced about the correctness of the principles of prophetic interpretation based upon the study of Revelation 9. And finally, she says, on the falling of the stars, when people saw this, she says, many were led to heed the message of the second advent, and similarly, a wonderful impetus was given to the advent movement. So the language is so similar that uh, it is clear Ellen White wasn't just recalling or reflecting what people thought, just as much as she was clear that the prophecy of Revelation 6 verse 13 about the falling of the stars did come true in the same way she was clear that Revelation 9 was fulfilled uh, in 1840, August 11. And on this chart we have the early Adventists were sure about this. They had this on their 1850 chart and right here you'll see on this chart the fifth angel. Revelation 9 verse 1, and it talks about the starting and all of many of these things. Uh, he, the old English was the Mohammedans, the Muslims, they're talking about right here. And so this chart shows how our early Adventist pioneers understood the fulfillment of this prophecy of Revelation 9. Now it was Josiah Litch, by the way, uh, who was involved. He was the one in 1838 who first made the prediction. And the Signs of the Times article, he correctly pointed out after two years of further study, he then came up with a specific day. In 1838, he had first just said sometime in the month of August. As he studied and as he studied, based upon the starting point of 1299, he eventually concluded, and the specific day was July 27, he concluded that the prophecy should end on the 11th of August, 1840. By the way, many Protestants have had different views over time. But back then in the 1830s, 1840s, the general Protestant view was that the fifth trumpet referred to the Saracens and the sixth to the Turks. Now, William Miller came along as this Baptist preacher and saw the two time periods, the five months or 150 days, as contiguous with the 391 years and 15 days. And he saw them to be together. Litch agreed. And it was Litch who identified the starting point as on the 27th of July, 1299. The starting point of the fifth trumpet going for 150 years and then contiguous with the sixth trumpet going through August 11, when Litch said the Ottoman power in Constantinople, modern day Istanbul, may be expected to be broken. 
and this was published on the 1st of August, 1840. And by the way, later on, a well-known writer by the name of Uriah Smith in his book, Daniel and Revelation, he essentially echoed Josiah Litch. And for about a century, about a hundred years, this concept of the fulfillment of the fifth and the sixth trumpet was standard, was orthodox, was the main view held amongst Seventh-day Adventists. And of course, as we've already mentioned in her book, The Great Controversy, Ellen White endorses and strengthens it. And by the way, just so that we are aware, the Muslim Turks were a positive force in a certain sense, just as God used Nebuchadnezzar to bring judgment upon uh, people of Judah because they had strayed away. Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 makes it very clear. In a similar way, uh, God used the Muslims, the Ottoman Empire, to stop the spread of false teachings of the early apost the church that was moving towards apostasy. And, and in a similar way, we find that uh, when there was an edict of death pronounced on the Protestants, that uh, I quote now from J.A. Wiley's History of Protestantism, he says it was the Turk, the Muslim Turk, who suddenly stepped forward to save Protestantism in Hungary. Having trampled down the king and his army, the victorious Soliman the Magnificent held on his way into Hungary. This calamity, which thrilled all Europe, brought rest to the Protestants. So I wanted to mention this, the reality of the fact that the Muslims were being used positively by God, and they are a fulfillment of prophecy, which is what our early Adventist pioneers did hold. And I know there's been a debate about the starting point of 1299, because it used to be accepted, the date from Edward Gibbon, but different people have come up with different suggestions in different days. Could it be rather 1301 or 1302 is some of the modern argument that's being used nowadays. However, in my study, I found many sources. And let me just mention a few. Moses Coit Tyler, professor of history at Cornell University way back in 1900, spoke about Othman, number one, not the first, is considered the founder of the Ottoman Empire when? A.D. 1299, not 1301 or 1302. Then there's a professor of history from Columbia University, Carlton Hayes, H-A-Y-E-S, back in 1929, again, having the Ottoman Empire begin in the year 1299. Now you'll say, well, that's almost a century ago. We'll give you a more, few more updated ones. Professor of history at Stanford University, Wayne Vucinich, okay, and he says the Otto Ottoman state and dynasty were founded by Osman 1299 to 1326 and bore his name. That was 1965. What about 1993? Again, another book uh, which says the, uh, the Ottoman Empire was 1299, and that's a starting point. Let's go into the 21st century. Daniel Goffman, who wrote a book published by Cambridge University has the Ottoman Empire start at 1299. In 2002, a book published by well-respected uh, academic publisher, Brill, the, this is written by Soraya Faroki, who is a professor of history at Bilgi University in Istanbul, Turkey. She indicates, I quote, the beginning of the Ottoman dynasty from 1299. This is in a book called The Ottomans and the Balkans. Uh, Mustafa Kiba Roglu and uh, his co-author, both professors at MEF University, Istanbul, in a 2009 book, have the Ottoman Empire, which was founded in 1299. I'll give one more example. I could continue. There are many, many sources. What I would suggest is those who claim 1299 doesn't have any validity, I'm afraid have not gone and done careful homework. One more, Andrew Finkel, Turkey, What Everyone Needs to Know. That's the name of the book. Published by whom? Oxford University Press, well respected. On page 11 in this 2012 book, Finkel says, the Ottoman Empire was founded in AD 1299. There's just so much evidence, we don't have to doubt. And of course, July 27 is also well respected. The main debate had been on the year, was it 1299 or 1301 or 1302? But there's massive amount of evidence that it is respected and accepted and agreed that 1299 was the actual starting year. By the way, a brief sketch of the larger historical context of all of these matters may be helpful as to what was happening around this time. Now, the Ottoman Empire, starting in 1299, had grown, had grown, and for 
half a millennium, over 500 years, it had expanded and expanded. And in its expansion, it had begun to actually, by being so large, it had stopped the spread of the early apostasy of the early church. So that's what had happened. However, over time, over maybe 100, 150 years, the Ottoman Empire had begun to decline. One of its vassals, kind of like a governor in modern American parlance, his name was Mehmet Ali, and he was ruling Egypt. In modern terms, he was the governor of Egypt. But he had become increasingly rebellious against the Sultan, the ruler of the Ottoman Empire. Mehmet Ali, if you study the history, it's fascinating. He had captured the army within a, a couple of weeks or so. He had also uh, gotten the fleet to uh, capitulate to his side. And all within a period of about three weeks, the Sultan passed away and passed on uh, the uh, leadership of the entire Ottoman Empire to his 16-year-old son, Abdul Medjid. And of course, all of Europe were really worried by this because with this vassal, Ali causing these problems, the leading powers in Europe were afraid that the Ottoman Empire would collapse and the European powers would all try to grab a peace and would go to war with each other. So what they decided to do was to try to keep the Ottoman Empire in a certain sense propped up. That's the best way I can say it. Thus, England, Austria, Prussia, and Russia got together in London on July 15, 1840 and formed there what is called the Treaty of London. And in this treaty, they agreed to send an ultimatum to that rebel governor down in Egypt, saying to him, stop your rebellion against the Ottoman Empire, or you will have to face war with us, <laughs> the so-called Christian nations. In essence, it was very clear that these European nations were, were taking over uh, and uh, becoming the leader now and uh, trying to keep uh, the 16-year-old sultan uh, leading his Ottoman Empire that was clearly crumbling. And uh, they were the ones who were in power, as I will read in a few minutes from a, a well-known historian. So that was what was happening. Now, remember that was signed on July 15, 1840. Now it's interesting. Some people have said, look, Litch said that this uh, 1299 starting date was July 27, and then Litch said it came through on August 11, 1840, if you start back from 1299 and you end up with that. But the treaty was signed on July 15, so Litch was wrong, some have claimed. But what's interesting, I discovered a newspaper so going to the Library of Congress. This is the Morning Herald from London that said as follows. It must be remarked that the act of the conference, the Treaty of London, has not yet been officially notified to Muhammad Ali. All he has received has been the non-official information of what was going on. The, in, the official note must be transported by the porte to him, the ambassador, and on his reply to the porte, the future will depend. Now, it's interesting. Was the newspaper correct? And this newspaper, by the way, was, uh, the article was written uh, on the 7th of August. Yes, indeed, the newspaper comment is quite accurate. It accurately conveyed a vital factor specifically added on as, I quote, a separate act to form part of the convention of 15th July 1840. Under the subheading of, quote, conditions imposed on Muhammad Ali, it indicated that this Treaty of London, which was signed on July 15, 1840, would become effective once, and I'm quoting now, communication thereof shall have been made to him, this is Mehmet Ali, at Alexandria by an agent of His Highness. It's very clear that though it was, the treaty was signed on July 15, the treaty itself includes a statement that it only becomes effective when it is handed over. Now, if you go to the newspapers, and this, by the way, is one that's in the commercial advertiser of New York, United States, where I came across this article, which was eventually published on the 17th of September, 1840. And this is what it says. The Treaty of the Five Powers, those are the four European powers with Turkey, 
was signed on the 15th of July and was conveyed to Constantinople by Mr. Moore on the 3rd of August. Then it continues and it says, on the 4th of August, His Excellency Rashid Pacha had an audience of the Sultan to receive orders concerning the transmission of the treaty to Alexandria by Rifat Bey, in consequence of which that functionary, the ambassador, left Constantinople on the 7th for Alexandria. Now what's interesting, the newspaper is tracing the itinerary of the treaty. Then it continues and it says the Austrian frigates, now remember it was Austria, England, Prussia and Russia that had combined to form this treaty. So there were two Austrian ships, the Medes and the Guerrero, they were on the Mediterranean coast and the newspaper says the Austrian frigates quitted or left Smyrna on the 9th, this is the 9th of August, for Alexandria. Why? To be present at the ceremonial of delivering the ultimatum. It was a big thing. The signing was important, but there was a special ceremonial. And as you trace the itinerary, it becomes clear that uh, things were moving towards the right time. It's amazing the way the Lord led and God worked here. And sure enough, as you study it, you begin to see September 5, 1840 identifies and says the arrival of Rifat Bey, this is the ambassador, with that treaty, okay, from Constantinople on the 11th instant, and instant means of this month, Old English, on the 11th instant with the ultimatum of the four powers produced a great sensation here. Very interesting. So the treaty arrived at that very time. Other newspapers echo the same thing. And of course in the United States there was a great interest because of this. Uh, the New York Spectator of September 26, 1840 says, the arrival of the, and they have it in quotes, the ultimatum. Everybody knew what was happening in Europe, uh, in the United States, who were following the news by newspapers. The arrival of the ultimatum at Alexandria on the 11th of August created no little stir among the foreign mercantile uh, residents, particularly the English. The Philadelphia uh, National Gazette echoes the same thing on the arrival of, at Alexandria of Rifat Bey from Constantinople with the ultimatum of the four powers on the 11th of August, and it continues. So there are many newspapers. It's amazing how many newspapers echo that the 11th of August was the day that this ultimatum was delivered. Now, there's a Muslim scholar who published a book called A Short History of Islam about 700 pages. His name was Sayyid Fayyaz Mahmoud. And in this book on page 581, Mr. Mahmoud says, talking about that 1840 Treaty of London, remember, signed on July 15, but delivered and made effective on August 11. This is what Mr. Mahmoud says. Clearly, the death knell had rung for the Ottoman Empire. Published uh, by Oxford University Press. Oxford is well recognized and here is a Muslim scholar who recognizes that. So the Muslim recognizes it and that was published in 1960 by the way, 120 years afterwards recognizing this. Now go back to 1840 because by the end of the year, specifically on December 1, 1840, the Morning Herald in London, the editorial was discussing what had happened and uh, one of the things they, they ask is this, and uh, have we done anything to stop the challenges in the Ottoman Empire and, and to help the Sultan? And what have we done? Big questions they were asking in the editorial. This is what they say. We fear that the Sultan has been reduced to the rank of a puppet. Aha, who's in charge? <laughs> the four powers of Europe. And that the sources of the Turkish Empire strength are irretrievably destroyed. Now this is December 1, 1840. I know there are some who say, well, the Ottoman Empire didn't collapse, nothing happened. And then here, by December 1, 1840, the newspaper, the Morning Herald, is category saying this. And by the way, I know it's hard to find the newspaper, a little history of that discovery. I went to the Library of Congress, they didn't have it. They said this newspaper is available in three places on planet Earth. One is the British Library in London, and of course I couldn't fly over there just to find one newspaper. The other one was University of Madison, uh, Wisconsin. Uh, uh, 
and uh, they, they, that's the second place. And the third one was at the research centers, uh, centers for research uh, libraries in Chicago. And so I went to Chicago, and there they were, this unusual library. I had to pay $25 just to go in. <laughs> and there they were digitizing and photographing newspapers. That's about all they seemed to be doing. It's an amazing place. And I spent many hours there uh, hunting for this newspaper. This newspaper wasn't digitized, but you have to go through page after page, and these are the big sheets and the small print. But it was an amazing discovery because this newspaper, until that point in time when I was privileged to find it, had never been identified. This is the first time we've now got it. The Morning Herald, December 1, 1840, that identifies and specifically says what happened. In a nutshell, the Ottoman Empire was destroyed. Now, it hung on for a many uh, decades, and it was called the Sick Man of Europe by Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. And uh, um, one scholar in the Ottoman Endgame, his name was uh, McMeekin in 2015, said this about the Ottoman Empire. For a terminally ill patient, the sick man of Europe took a long time to die. In a certain sense, it was as though he, the Ottoman Empire got shot and the bullet wound didn't kill the person, uh, the, the Ottoman Empire, but the person, or this Ottoman Empire rather, hung on and hung on like a person who gets shot and maybe goes to the hospital. Uh, I, re I read a story of a man who died decades after he got shot by, uh, because of the complications that set in after time. And in a certain way, the same thing happened here. Yes, but August 11, 1840 is the key. Now, more recently, in 2014, a scholar has said this about the treaty, the 1840 treaty. This scholar's name is Ira Lapidus, a highly distinguished scholar, now retired professor at uh, UC Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley, and a very distinguished scholar of Islamic history. Talking about that 1840 treaty of London, he said, the Ottoman Empire had become, notice the language, a protectorate of Europe and a pawn of the great powers. So, of course, the question is, who was in control? Not the Ottoman Empire anymore, but these powers of Europe. The Ottoman Empire's power was gone. Litch had predicted, and I quote, the 11th of August, 1840, the Ottoman power may be expected to be broken. And thus far, I found newspapers in, from Britain, from Scotland, from Ireland, and from the United States. Four countries about eight or so different newspapers, all of which identify the arrival of the ultimatum on the 11th of August. In a nutshell, yes, the treaty was made on July 15, but the treaty was made effective on the 11th of August, and that was the death knell of the Ottoman Empire, recognized. Now, what's interesting, if you go back to the statement I read earlier from the book, The Great Controversy, page 334-335, Ellen White did say that the Ottoman Empire, quote, accepted the protection of the Allied powers of Europe. Notice the language, the Allied powers of Europe. In this 2014 book by Ira Lapidus, he said the Ottoman Empire had become a protectorate of Europe. Almost the same language. And Ellen White said that the Ottoman Empire placed herself under the control of Christian nations. Ira Lapidus says it became a pawn of the great powers. The language is so similar, the idea is the same. The 1911 Great Controversy is now being echoed by the 2014 book called A History of Islamic Societies, recognizing this important 1840 pro uh, prediction that came true based upon Revelation chapter 9, the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet. Now the question is, how did the pioneers, the Advent pioneers, part of the Millerite movement, as well as those who began the Seventh-day Adventist Church. How did they view this prophecy? For example, Uriah Smith noted, I quote, the exact accomplishment of the event predicted, showing as it did the right application of the prophecy, gave a mighty impetus to the great Advent movement. That's from his book called Daniel and Revelation, page 517. The well-known scholar John Nevins Andrews noted, he called this a demonstration of the truthfulness of the mode of calculation respecting the prophetic times was given to the world. 
So this is recognized by early pioneers. And obviously, this was a litmus test. When Litch had come up with this specific day, there were some that were worried. Are you uh, not uh, going out on a limb too far? Now, it is true, Litch wasn't 100% certain. He said, if I've done this, if I've done, uh, based upon my calculations, it can be expected. But he had done his homework, <laughs> and people were expecting it. And in a nutshell, as a young man from Iceland in his master's thesis one day stated, Jón Stefansson put it this way, this, this August 11, 1840 prediction was an obvious litmus test for the year day principle and the Millerite expositions. After August 11, 1840, when the year day principle was validated, the Millerite movement took off with great power. Revelation 9 was regarded as one of the most important time prophecies during the Millerite movement and early Seventh-day Adventism. And Jon Stephenson is correct. His uh, master's thesis is available online through Andrews University. From Clear Fulfillment to Complex Prophecy is the title of his master's thesis. Now, some significant conclusions we can draw from our study. Number one, if Bible prophecy is true, it can be verified by history. If it cannot, we either do not understand history or we don't understand the text properly. To say that the seven trumpets, specifically trumpets number five and number six, are incomprehensible is to deny the opening words of the book of Revelation, which state that those who read and keep and hence understand the things which are written therein shall be blessed. Again, this is Jon Stephenson who correctly pointed this out. So that's the first thing. Prophecy and history go hand in hand. If the prophecy is true, history will verify it. The second conclusion that's significant, the fifth and sixth trumpets as we have talked about here today, give more evidence that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. We can trust it. We can study it. We can know. Of course, the focus of the uh, prophecies, even though we've been talking here about time, the real focus of the book of Revelation is found right there in Re Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. It's the revelation of Jesus. Now, these time prophecies are important, but let's keep in mind that all of our study has to always take us back to focusing on Jesus. So this is the revelation of Jesus. But we do know now that the scriptures are uh, inspired. There's more evidence for that from the evidence we've had before. So Revelation chapter 9 provides additional evidence of the inspiration of scripture. Number three, this prophecy of the trumpets and its fulfillment shows that God worked through Muslims to stop the spread of apostate early Christianity with its false teachings. It's fascinating. There's not enough time to go into all of those details, but go ahead and study it for yourself and you can see how the spread of the Ottoman Empire helped to stop the spread of the apostate teachings of that early Christian movement. In the third or fourth, uh, rather, let's say it was after the um, Ottoman Empire uh, got going, around 12, 1300, 1299 and further as the Ottoman Empire grew. Now, obviously, Muslims started in the 630s um, when we see um, the uh, work there of Muhammad, uh, born in 570, and within the time he died by 632, uh, the Muslims were already growing. But I'm thinking specifically of the Ottoman Empire and how it spread massively from 1299 onwards. Number four. When we look at what the Muslims did in aiding the Hungarians specifically, for example, Wiley, the historian, says this, I quote, Under the reign of Islam, the gospel had greater quietness in Hungary. And so, in a sense, we can actually thank our Muslim brothers and sisters for aiding the gospel's spread when they came to the rescue, as we read earlier from Wiley's uh, book. Yes. The Muslims have been prophesied in Scripture. Early pioneers, early Adventists believed it. And now we have amazing newspaper evidence to corroborate all of the stuff we have been studying. 
I'll admit it was information I was totally unaware of. I never realized that this prophecy was in the book. I'd read the book, but I'd missed it. I never realized the significance of it until one day my superior, my supervisor said, Ron, go and find the evidence. And over a period of about two years, I got to travel to four states, five research centers, and I found all of this incredible information, specifically the newspapers. Now, in mid-2018, I had the opportunity to go to Rome in Italy and to make a presentation on this topic to many scholars. And after I had shared this information there, uh, Dr. Jerry Moon, retired chairman of the Adventist Studies section at the seminary at Andrews University, wrote the following statement to leading Seventh-day Adventist editors. I quote, this topic is necessary, even essential and indispensable for the new encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, because it the study of August 11, 1840. It conclusively protects a major cornerstone of Seventh-day Adventist prophetic interpretation, namely the year-day principle. And for the viewers, I want to just say, thank God, I have been invited now to participate in to get an article ready for this new online edition of the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists. And hopefully, rather sooner rather than later, this material can be available there for anyone to read carefully to go back and look at the sources so that you can also check this out for yourself to understand this incredible prophecy and fulfillment. In a nutshell, early Adventists aptly, correctly recognize the amazing role of Islam in Bible prophecy. This prediction and its fulfillment were a great blessing to the early Millerites, to the early Adventists. For a hundred years, Adventists understood it, believed it, and it was a very important prophecy. My challenge to all viewers, study it for yourself. Go and look for the sources. But you have to go back to the original sources. You have to go back to the newspapers to see what was happening. Hopefully sooner, we will, sooner rather than later, we'll get this available online. And I want to challenge everyone to reclaim the wonderful legacy we had, a legacy of studying the prophecy of Revelation 9 and recognizing the role of Islam in Bible prophecy, specifically the fifth and sixth trumpets, how God worked mightily through the Muslims, a blessing to his people. May God bless you as you study scripture. Let us pray. Holy Father, thank you again for the opportunity today of digging deeply into your word, specifically looking at the fulfillment of the fifth and sixth trumpets, the time prophecies that are now verified, validated with actual newspaper articles. Help us to trust your word. Mostly help us to study the word as Revelation 1 verse 1 says, it's the revelation of Jesus. Help us to dig deeper. In his name we pray. Amen.